Uh, welcome. This is the July meeting for the Equality Garden Club. Uh, the topping, topping. Uh, the topic this month is Florida Native Orchids and the Million Orchid Project. Our speaker will be Rich Ackerman, and this will be on Zoom as well as on Facebook. Uh, just as a note, anyone who is in our Zoom meeting, please do not turn your video on or unmute yourself. Questions can be asked directly into the chat. And if you're on Facebook, feel free to type in um, your questions directly on the original video, not on a shared version of the video. And we can kind of uh, co collate your questions and give them to Rich at the end of the meeting so that we can get some answers for you guys. So we will start with opening remarks by me. I am the club's marketing manager. We will then move into the meeting opening by our club president, Van. And from there, Van will uh, pass it over to Carl, who is our vice president, and will do introductions and comments for Rich Ackerman, our speaker, who will do a presentation. We hope to get through by around eight o'clock. And then there will be a question and answer period where any questions that you post, uh, whether it is Facebook or Zoom, will be answered then. And then, um, it will be passed back over to our club president or our club vice president, Carl, for uh, comments and announcements. And from there, it will be turned over to Van to do closing remarks. Um, some simple, uh, simple uh, remarks and instructions, some, some tips really. Uh, all audience members should remain muted and without video. This is just to prevent distractions from the overall meeting. If you're on Zoom, please post your questions in the chat. There should be a chat button on your screen somewhere. If you do get disconnected, feel free to rejoin. Uh, just be patient because you're put into a waiting room and I need to make sure I can get into that waiting room and admit you into the meeting. I do check on that, but sometimes it takes a couple of minutes. And if you're on our Facebook Live, again, please post your questions as a comment on the original video. So just literally click the video, it'll take you into the original video and you can comment there. That's where the videos will be monitored, or I'm sorry, the comments will be monitored by Mario, who will allow um, for any good questions that haven't already been answered to be added to a question and answer sheet that we will uh, go through after the, the presentation is over. Um, again, Carl, our club vice president, will be monitoring all of the chats in Zoom. So again, if you have questions, please post them directly in there and Carl will get that for you. And I will mostly be behind the scenes. You will hear from me every once in a while. Uh, I will become a little bit more pre uh, prevalent when we get into our question and answer portion because the question and answer portion will allow um, me to open up all of your questions to Rich so that he can answer them. And from there, I just thank you for joining us. Um, I'm, I'm very excited everyone is here. So give me one second. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn things over to Van. And a good evening. <laughs> Welcome to the Equality Garden Club members uh, and to our guests for our third virtual meeting. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The times have been tough. The gardeners among us plant in anticipation of growth and renewal. And as people who appreciate gardens, we are predisposed to optimism. With all the recent news, it lifts my spirits, and I hope yours as well, to know that we as a group and individually continue to hope and we plan for the future. And with that in mind, I truly hope that you enjoy this presentation where we appreciate what has been in the past and we're looking forward to recreating and, and improving our future with it. We had a recent uh, poll to our members and the response was good, very good as far as I'm concerned. We had 100% of the respondents to that poll said that they favored a contribution of the club to the Million Orchid Project and fully 30% of those respondents expressed the desire to volunteer to uh, install those things. So we have a good solid base here for this, this project and I'm very, very happy to, to say that. Um, going to some of the business here, I'll kind of keep it quick. Um, our website has much improved. I'm sure that people have been following and have realized that. We now include all of our virtual meetings as well as the newsletters so you can catch up any past material 
or if you're interested in looking for it, go for it. And you can also even look at our press releases that been there and the good press that we're getting. We're getting lots of good press. That's great. I'm very happy about that. All right. Uh, the board has been busy as well. We're always busy. Uh, one of the things we've done, as I've just mentioned, we're using chip mail to go and poll our members. This is going to increase our membership's ability to participate and to guide the board. That's going to be great. We'll have a much better idea of what's going on in the minds of our membership. We don't have to guess anymore. We can actually ask you and hopefully you'll respond. And um, this is a much more transparent and it'll be much more representative of the members. And I'm really looking forward to using this to its full capability. I said at the very beginning of my tenure here, six months ago, seven months ago, that I would keep my, uh, my comments brief. People come here not to look at my handsome face. They look, they're here to go and listen to these wonderful people who's talking and know much more about things than I do. So I want to introduce Carl Scherer. He's our Vice President of Programming and he in turn, We'll be introducing our feature speaker, and I'll see you at the end of the meeting. Welcome to the Quality Garden Club monthly presentation. Um, remember, as uh, Justin has stated, uh, please provide your comments if you're uh, in Facebook or if you're in Zoom through chat. We are monitoring throughout the presentation, and we'll provide to uh, Rich, our speaker, at the end for a question and answer session. For awareness, Due to the significant information that Rich is going to provide to us, we did uh, develop a significant list of questions and we have already provided those to Rich in advance. So that should obviously be quite helpful in, uh, with the presentation. Tonight, we have a treat in store uh, and that we're fortunate to have Rich uh, speak to us in detail in regards to the Million Orchid Project that he currently leads. Rich has lived in Fort Lauderdale for over 30 years where he has grown a wide variety of, of types of plants. His current interest is Florida native orchids. With a master's degrees in computer science and library and information science, he worked in software research and development, project management, and leadership positions in the industry and in academic libraries. He was named Professor Emeritus upon retirement from the Broward College as Associate Dean in 2018. He caught the orchid bug attending the World Orchid Conference in Miami in 2008. Rich is a Florida Master Gardener volunteer, currently serves as president of the Fort Lauderdale Orchid Society, and is a member of the National Wildlife Federation Association for Computing Machinery. With that, let's introduce Rich Ackerman. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I want to thank Carl and Van a lot um, for uh, the opportunity to uh, speak here tonight. Um, our societies have, um, have worked together well um, for years and years and years, and I'm really um, glad to be continuing that tradition. Um, the overriding goal of this project is to uh, restore the native orchids to our environment here in Broward County. Um, Broward County is now the most densely settled county in the state of Florida. Uh, we have less open land than any other county from a percentage point of view. And um, so it's, an, it's a really important project. It's orchids used to be everywhere and um, now they're very rare. So we're working together uh, with other groups like yourselves to, uh, to bring them back. So without um, much more than that, uh, these are the basic things I'm going to talk about in my presentation. I'm gonna talk very, very, very tiny little bit about um, a, a botany and propagation. Um, I actually do a 45 minute class at Bar College for their botany class. I talk about orchid botany with them and that's always a lot of fun. So I've taken it from 45 minutes down to three minutes for you. So it's just enough to understand kind of what's important. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about history, a little bit more about history of Million Orchid Project, uh, some of the conservation challenges uh, in Florida and the strategies that we are using uh, through Million Orchid Project to restore native orchids. And then um, most of the talk actually is going to be on activism. It's really talking about how um, Equality Garden Club and how other groups in the community can help um, with this project of restoring our native orchids uh, into the tree canopies. So that's kind of the outline of where I'm going to go and I'll do my best to uh, finish up on time so I don't keep you all too late. Um, so orchid basics, 
Um, this is a, a little encyclia tampensis that you see there. That's uh, in my yard. And we just had a course on photography. So now I know how to take a much better picture, but that's an, that's an ET. Um, from a botanical point of view, the family is Orchidaceae. Uh, it's a very, very large family of plants, um, 800 genera, 28,000 species around the world. Um, I think there's about 200 genera in America. I didn't put the, the numbers in for America. Um, Florida, we have 56 genera, 120 species. Um, and those aren't all actually native because the Atlas of Florida plants includes things that are introduced from outside. So there's actually like an invasive orchid, um, Eulophia graminia, that is included on their list. Um, but it's a pretty good ballpark, give you an idea of how many, um, how many native orchids there are in Florida. Uh, in general, they're epiphytic. Uh, so that means they live up in the trees. Um, it, certainly in South Florida, we have many, many, many epiphytes. Um, as you move north, they become more terrestrial. Obviously, the winters are kind of hard on epiphytes. So uh, things tend to grow on the ground. Um, and there's also some uh, lithophytes, so those grow on stone. Um, from a botanical point of view, there's a high degree of speciation amongst orchids, which means that the species are very specific to a growing area, a location, uh, to pollination needs, uh, germination needs, pollination strategies. Um, and there, while there are some species that are very broad, there are many, many more that are, uh, grow in pretty small pockets. And we have those in Florida. I mean, we have Tempensis, which is what you're looking at, grows pretty widely up and down the, the coastal regions on both the East Coast and the West Coast of Florida. Um, but there are a lot of orchids that have evolved uh, to uh, live in the Fakahatchee Strand or in the Everglades and in very specialized environments. Um, so it's a, it's a very interesting plant from a botanical point of view. Now this is the most technical I get. I promise it gets easier from this. But I we need to understand um, how orchids reproduce if we're going to understand a million orchid project. So this is a little bit about orchid reproduction. Um, obviously, you all know about pollination. You're all gardeners. Um, in an orchid, the seeds are developed um, when the pollen is taken by a, a pollinator um, from one plant to another generally, put on a stigmatic surface, and then the seeds develop up inside the ovary. The seed capsule tends to mature in three to six months, sometimes as fast as two months, sometimes as long as a year. And the seeds are really tiny. Um, this, the diagram here is a typical monocot seed. This would be like a kernel of corn or something. And this section here is, is called the endosperm. This is the food for that seed. And in sort of typical uh, plants, typical monocots, uh, that food source is what drives, gives the, the seed the energy to start to grow. So it's planted, you plant corn in the ground, um, it throws up a leaf, and there's food in the seed to drive that initial growth. Um, with orchids, there is no endosperm. Um, the bottom diagram shows you uh, a microscope photograph of an orchid seed. Uh, it's one millimeter, tiny. These things are just like dust. And if you look at it, it's the, all this stuff is air. There's two cells on either side that are a cell wall, or the seed coat, they call it. Um, and then this in the middle is sort of the DNA. This is the genetic material that's actually going to make an orchid. Um, and so when these, when the seed capsules mature, they dehiss, which means they kind of crack open, and the seeds are dispersed in the wind. So they just go floating away. They just float in the air. It's so cool. You get one and you shake it out. You think the seeds are going to fall to the ground. No, they just float away. Um, so if we, and they make tons of seeds, the 3,000 to 4 million. There's an orchid biology book I read that said there's actually an orchid that makes 4 million seeds per capsule, um, which is just mind blowing. Um, now, why, don't, why aren't we covered in orchids if they're making tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of seeds? Well, the seeds need to land next to a particular kind of mycorrhizal fungi for germination to occur. Uh, so it's like basically, you know, a seed is going to be floating in the air 
and it needs to go up and find an oak tree or uh, you know something on the ground that has exactly the right kind of fungus uh, for that seed to germinate uh, for that to happen. And there's something like 600 different kinds of different species of mycorrhizal fungi. Um, so that's another sort of complication is that if your if your fungi go away, you can have the plants, you can have the pollinators, but the seedlings will never develop because the seeds won't get um, won't get germinated. Um, and overall, it's a really long process. It takes from two to six years really to get from seed to flower. Um, a lot of orchid hybridizing is aimed at shortening that for commercial purposes. Um, so they want to make a Phalaenopsis that they can take from seed, they can do a cross, and then get it blooming really, really quickly so they can get it to market. Um, but typically it's about two years in flask and then another year of hardening off as a seedling before it's really even ready to go out. Um, and most of the orchids that you see in the stores are probably five years old. Um, so it's a long and pretty expensive process. And this is what the process looks like if you're doing it in a lab. Um, this little chart came from Fairchild and it's a really good representation of what happens. Um, you start with this little fruit here, which is that what they call a seed capsule. Uh, the botanists call it a fruit. Um, so you've got 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 seeds in here. And basically you um, put the seed into a sterile bottle that's got a, a germination media in the bottom of it. And you can kind of see in these flasks that they have a little layer on the bottom that's a, it's like an agar uh, chemical mix with nutrients and hormones and sugars. Um, so they start in a germination flask here. This is called a mother flask. And then they get transplanted, they get replated is what it's called. And they, they start to develop here and then they get replated again. So there's a whole bunch of uh, transplanting that goes on. And they finally, once the flasks, the bottles are, orchids are decent size, they're put out into trays like this for further growth. So it's a long process. Um, when I was in the Master Gardener program last year, it was like this revelation to me that, you know, you could actually put something in the ground and it would grow again. I'd been growing orchids for so long and I was used to having them all take so many years that it was like, wow, you can just plant a plant and it grows. It's, I'd sort of forgotten about that. So it's a real great breakthrough. Um, so anyway, that's sort of where we're at with reproduction and, and how we make orchids. Um, so at this point, I would stop and say, does anybody have any questions? But we're trying to keep on trucking here. So I'm gonna keep on trucking. Um, so next I'm gonna talk a little bit about Million Orchid Project. Um, and this is my history section, as I promised. So Million Orchid Project, is run out of Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden in Miami, uh, started in 2012, as you can see. And basically they got some um, funding, I think they won a grant, a big grant, to build a new science center there. And so they decided that they would go around and, and look at um, sort of the science buildings and science you know, institutions at other uh, horticultural gardens around the world. So they did that and they found at us in Singapore, the Singapore Botanic Garden had an orchid propagation lab they, where they had DNA analysis machines, they had laminar flow hoods, they had all the equipment that you needed to do a really great job with um, orchids. And so they said that that's, that's sort of where they got the idea for this. Um, the garden had set up that lab and they had done a similar project to the Million Orchid Project where they had collected seed uh, from orchids that were growing in Singapore. Um, Singapore is an island state um, and it's very, very densely populated, but they have a really terrific um, park system. So they're very uh, sort of environmentally aware and they're very garden aware. Um, and so the Singapore Botanical Garden was running basically the, before the Million Orchid Project existed, they were doing this. They were taking um, orchids and putting them into the parks, and putting them into the cities, and just to see if it would work. Nobody really knew if this would work or not. And so they did that in Singapore, and it works really well. And there's orchids all over the place. There's these big monster grammatophyllum there, um, all kinds of stuff. Uh, so they came back to Fairchild, built up the lab, started the Million Orchid Project, and here we are today, um, eight years later. 
Um, their initial goal, and their goal still, is to put a million orchids into the urban landscape of Miami, originally Miami-Dade. Um, they're not aimed at conservation in the national parks. They're not out in the Everglades. They're not in the Fakahatchee. They're not in Big Panther. Um, they're really focused on the urban landscape. Uh, so they're talking, you're talking parks, uh, schools, um, you know, in the city uh, kinds of stuff. Um, and the way that um, Fairchild has done it is that they've gotten involved, very heavily involved with the educational system in Miami. So they are uh, running Million Orchid projects in over 100 schools in Miami-Dade. Uh, they have uh, little kits that they sell that are great, or they donate, I don't know if they sell them or not. Um, but stands, grow stands, uh, they have a bus that they converted to be a micropropagation lab, a school bus, and the school bus runs out to elementary schools and the kids all go on and do micropropagation. Micro They're running, working in a laminar flow hood, uh, doing flasking, doing that transplanting that I showed you before. Um, and it's very technical work, but it, the kids are really, really interested in it. And they start in as early as middle schools. I think there's some elementary schools now that are doing it as well. And I don't know how it's, how they're, what they're doing with the COVID. I mean, that's a really interesting question I haven't asked them about. Um, but I think the schools are probably closed at this point. So I don't know exactly where all of that's at, but I do know that they've had well over, you know, 150, 200,000 students um, that touch orchids and help grow orchids through this program. Um, they've had, you know, Jason said probably two or 3,000 teachers, um, thousands of volunteers. They did at one event at Fairchild about a year and a half ago, and they said they had 1,500 adult volunteers at this one event. Um, so it's very, it's a really large scale project. And it's probably, we think it's probably the largest orchid project, orchid conservation project um, in the world. Uh, so far they've done, as it says, about 270,000 orchids. Um, they, the best of plans, you know, we've had hurricanes, now we have a pandemic. Uh, so there are challenges, um, but we keep on going and there's no real deadline. Well, that was one of the questions that, um, that I got from, from you folks. And there's no real deadline on um, basically Everyone's just going to keep working on it and uh, make it happen as, as soon as we can. I mean, it's, there are just so many variables and so many things happen along the way. But as long as people are interested, um, Fairchild is committed to keeping on doing it. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of an overview of Million Orchid Project. Um, there was another question about sort of geography, like what is the scope? Like who does what? Where are you located? And the way it's kind of broken out is basically, um, you know, there's three, we have these three southeast counties in Florida, right? So as I said, Fairchild is um, very focused on Miami-Dade. Uh, they have their STEM bus and the STEM bus can't leave um, Dade County because it belongs to the school system. And they have a rule that school buses can't leave Dade County. Uh, so they're, they're, they're doing Miami-Dade. Um, about five years ago, probably four years ago, a, folk, a bunch of people up at uh, Florida Atlantic University in West Palm Beach and Boca uh, got involved with Million Orchid Project and they started um, working with orchids and working with kids, working with an educational environment. And they've kind of spun off a, a program they called Orchids. Um, and so that's a very similar, they modeled it after Fairchild, they modeled after Million Orchid Project. And ORCHIDS is also very um, focused on education, getting students involved, and being in the schools, uh, and working with native ORCHIDS um, in Palm Beach County. Um, so that puts us in the middle, Broward County. Uh, we don't have a university. We don't have a huge botanical garden. And so FLOSS um, has kind of picked up the mantle here, and is kind of leading the charge for a million ORCHID project um, in Broward County. Um, I met Jason about five years ago. Jason is, I'm sorry, does Dr. Downing, Dr. Jason Downing is the orchid biologist and is the head of the project. 
um, and I met Jason about five years ago and uh, thought it'd be a, a great fit uh, between us and them. And it took a few years before he was kind of able to have the bandwidth and have the time to get involved with us. Um, but we've been working with them. Our, our society signed contracts and licenses and all this stuff a couple of years ago. So we've been working with them for, for two years now. Um, so I chased him for three years and now we've been working together for two years and it's really fun. He's a great guy. Um, if you ever get a chance to listen to him speak, you would definitely want to do that. Um, our focus in Broward County uh, has been more uh, residential uh, than uh, either what they do at Pine Jog or what they do at Fairchild. Um, we've been working with homeowners associations um, and with some, some governments, some city governments, um, but not really tied into the educational system. And it's not that we don't want to, but we're just not that kind of a group. We, we don't have, you know, educators. Uh, we don't, we're just not set up to do that. So we're, we're focused more on clubs, uh, homeowners associations, and, and people like that. So that's the geographical scope. Okay, this I already talked about a little bit. So this is a picture, this is a great picture of a cart of uh, cow horn. There's some cow horn fern or cow horn orchids in here and probably, uh, I don't know, I'd have to look at it. But these are all orchids. This is all a bunch of orchids getting taken out of the Thakahatchee. And this is what they used to do. Um, there have been a lot of challenges. These are sort of a list of what the challenges are. Um, pollinators have gone away. Um, so if you don't have pollinators, you can't make babies. Um, invasive plants, uh, this is something people don't think about. Invasive plants and smothered orchids, um, all the epiphytes. Uh, if you get a, a little philodendron that escapes from your house and it goes outside and it starts growing up an oak tree, what happens to it? Well, leaves get to be a foot wide and they smother everything underneath it. They smother the resurrection fern, they smother the orchids, they smother everything. And so invasive plants have had a real impact on the native orchid population. Uh, the mycorrhizal fungi I talked about already, same kind of thing, the fungus, like for the tampensis, the fungus lives in the oak tree. And when they're covered with invasive plants, the, the fungus dies, they don't get enough water. So they dry out and they die. Um, and then obviously there's a lot of poaching. This is what this picture is all about. Um, it was very fashionable around the turn of the century for um, people in uh, up north, I'll just leave it up north, uh, to have orchids in their dining room. So people would go out and, you know, rip orchids out of the Everglades, rip orchids out of the Pakahatchee and ship them up to New York or wherever, and they'd be on a dining room table for a month, and then they'd throw the plant away. And, you know, in many cases, these are plants that were 100 years old. Um, so there was a massive amount of poaching. And it still continues to this day. There are still people that go out into the Pakahatchee or out into the Everglades and uh, look for orchids and try to steal them. And it doesn't work. Um, they're not going to survive, but people don't know that. So poaching is still a problem. Um, and one of the one of the jokes that uh, Jason has about Million Orchid Project is that you know there's always going to be people that want to steal your orchids. And it's better if they steal one that was produced in a lab and put in a local park than if they go into the Everglades or they go out to the FAC and they steal something from out there. So, you know, there is a certain amount of loss. It, it's not really bad. It's not nearly as bad as most people think it will be. But when you go into a park and you put orchids out there, it's a target for people. Um, but it's not, it's, it's better that they steal those plants than things from nature. Um, and then the last one, and probably the worst, is habitat loss, just plain old habitat loss. Everything gets cut down, and all your, your um, larval plants go away. It's just the, you know, and we see it in Broward County, everything's been cut down. It was cleared for farming. It was cleared for development. And fortunately, now trees are being planted back. Native, there's a big native plant population. Um, and so the orchids are kind of the icing on the cake. We can go back to the tree canopy that's being restored and put orchids back into them. Um, still a problem up in West Palm Beach though. If you go up into Palm Beach County and you go out west, it's just massive habitat loss going on out there. They're just developing and developing and developing. It's, it's gonna turn into another Broward 20 years from now, it's gonna be the same. 
So that's, um, that's that. Though I couldn't do a, a talk on uh, native orchids without uh, showing you some native orchids. Um, these are all species that are Florida natives that are being propagated at um, Fairchild. Now I would ask, I would go around the room, if I was in a classroom, I'd go around in the room and ask you to identify these or to match them up because you've got some names over here and you've got some flowers over here. And I know some people in the audience and I know that some of you can do this, but I'd be really curious about how many of you could do that. Um, basically, we've got a Certipodium, uh, Tampensis, Encyclia Tampensis, we've got the Bledia purpurea, and we've got the Oncidium insatum here, the four pictures. Um, and they're very pretty. That's why we like them. So uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of Fort Lauderdale and our involvement, just give you a little bit of background there. Um, we, as I said, we joined up in 2018 and um, there's, I collected some seed. I started to collect seed for, for Broward County um, because the, the sort of the science of conservation says that if there are local populations of plants, you don't want to introduce uh, plants from outside a region into a different region. If you're trying to do conservation, you want to work with the, the, the DNA of the plants that are um, endemic in, in the area, living in the area. Um, so it's, and there's a whole rigmarole of permits and licenses and working with the state to be able to do this legally um, that we, we went through all those hoops. Um, so we started collecting seed 2018. And I actually just found out two days ago that one of the original seeds that, one of the original seed pods that I collected um, has been sent to a lab in the Dominican Republic. They've started that whole process that, or, you know, that I showed you about going from flask to flask and getting replated. And Jason told me a couple of days ago that they're talking about getting 100,000 orchids from the single seed capsule. And every, every, one, every seed capsule they deal with is labeled. And so this is CH2. So CH2 is very fruitful. And this picture here is, is actually, uh, from the next year, this is from 2019, but these are seed capsules in various stages of maturity that I collected and sent off to, uh, sent off to a lab for propagation. So we will have a lot of orchids next year. Um, we'll have Encyclia tempensis, um, lots and lots and lots of an ET. So we're looking for groups like Equality Garden Club that can do projects with these plants and get them out into your town. We're, we're doing Fort Lauderdale, we know Fort Lauderdale really well, but we're hoping that to find partners in Wilton Manors and Deerfield Beach and Plantation and Weston and just all over the county. Um, so that is us. Here's a little show and tell. This was, uh, these are the, so there's a question, who have you worked with? Where have you gone? What have you done? And these are the, um, basically the installations that we, as Fort Lauderdale Orchid Society have done. Um, we did our kickoff at our show last year. Um, so, or two, well, two shows ago, so two years ago. Um, and that was uh, pretty much a, a, a ceremonial event. It was in January, which is a terrible time to be planting baby orchids. Um, but we did that with the city. Uh, we worked with Broward College uh, this guy up in the tree is the landscape director, um, and so they uh, they were very um, very very interested. And then sort of COVID came along, and they've had a lot of cutbacks and stuff, so they're kind of struggling right now. Um, we've worked with a couple of neighborhood associations. Cooley Hammock was one of our originals, and uh, we were back with them for a second year. Uh, Riverlands Manor, uh, we did this year for the first time, and they're already signed up to get some plants for next year. And then we did a big project this year up in Oakland Park at the Sunson Nature Trail. And this top picture and this picture down here are uh, photographs from that um, project. And we just sort of finished the first phase of that this morning. Uh, we planted out about 400 orchids, I think, this morning. Um, we had probably 18 volunteers and we got there really early. It was beautiful morning. We had a lot of fun. It was really nice. We all had our masks on, we were all social distancing, but we got lots and lots of um, orchids into the trees. So it was really, really good. We had a great time. Um, and then this one, this is like, I just wanted, this is kind of inspirational and this actually predates the Million Orchid Project, um, but I wanted to share it with you anyway. Somebody just sent me this randomly a couple of weeks ago. And this is from, actually dates from 2015. 2015, if those of you who are here, 
remember that that was the 100th anniversary of Broward County. So Broward County decided to throw a birthday party for itself all year and have all, a lot of Broward 100 events is what they call them. So we got the bright idea of doing an ORCID event for Broward 100. So I went to Home Depot and I ordered, and I actually was successful in finding, which was unusual, but I found 100 um, Encyclia tempensis, our native orchid. And we did a, um, a giveaway and sort of an educational workshop along Riverwalk as part of their, one of their jazz Sundays or something like that. And so one of our members, Claire Garrett, is a great grower, and she got a little plant. It was just a little plant from Home Depot. And she planted it in her oak tree. And five years later, you see on the top, that's, those are the flowers this year. And then the picture, that's the lower picture, if you see all these little things here, okay, these are all the seed capsules that she produced on that plant. And she counted them, she's very analytical, and she counted them and she made uh, 23, or her orchid made 23 seed capsules this year. So she lives in Hollywood. Hopefully some of these seed capsules will spread their seed and some of the oak trees um, down there in the future will start to grow some seedlings from this. So this is eventually what's gonna happen with the orchids that we're putting up in Million Orchid Project. Um, they're a little bit smaller than this, so it's gonna take a little bit more than five years to, for them to get this size, but they will, and they're gorgeous, and they will make seed, and they will reproduce. So that's that. So now, I'm gonna take a glass of water, a sip of water, excuse me for a second, and talk a little bit about Activism, right on. How can you get involved? Um, so uh, Carl and Van approached me and, and I was, I was kind of a little bit shy because up until two days ago, I was thinking I was gonna get 10,000 orchids next year or I was gonna get, maybe if I was lucky, I'd get 20,000 orchids. And I already have promised 4,000 orchids to people for next summer. So I, initially I was like, okay, well, let's see what we can do. You know, yeah, I'm interested. Um, but I, we've been very, very constrained the last few years um, because we just didn't have a lot of orchids. But next year, we're going to have a lot of orchids. And so now we can really, like, open up the floodgates. So they said, so Carl and Van were saying, okay, so how can, our, how can we get involved? What can we do? And so I wanted to kind of give you some ideas. This is for Equality Garden Club. This is also for any orchid society that's out there listening. If you're a member of an orchid society, a different orchid society other than Floss, um, or if you are a member of a housing association or you're a member of a, another garden club, these, all of these things you know, apply equally well to you and to your situation. Um, so the very easiest thing is um, probably, well, the easiest is probably give money, make, make donations. Um, but volunteering is good too. Uh, we had, uh, what, 15 volunteers this morning up at the Stunson Trail in Oakland Park. They have a volunteer coordinator. You call him, you say, hey, I'd like to come. He says, great. And when you get up there, um, we give you a little training and uh, off you go. So it's very easy. Um, it's fun. Even in the age of pandemic, uh, you know, we all wear masks, um, you're outside, you're not in like a cl classroom or something like that or tight workspace. Um, so it's a chance to get out of the house and do something physical, breathe some fresh air, get some sun and uh, have some fun and make a contribution to the, to the environment as well. Um, make donations, you know, Floss would take a donation. Um, the Stunson Trail is, is actually doing crowdsourcing for their project, and they've raised over $6,000 so far. Their goal was $10,000, and they're up to, I think, $6,600. Um, so certainly, um, making a donation is, is relatively easy if you still have a job. If you don't, I feel sorry for you. I'm very sorry that this is going on in our society, um, but that's another way that you can help. And then, if you really want to get involved, if, if Equality Garden Club or any other group, um, you can really sort of start to think about doing projects yourself. And 
in a subsequent slide, like I'll explain like how we can help with this. So it sounds pretty intimidating probably, but we're gonna have tons of orchids. Fort Lauderdale Orchid Society is gonna be taking delivery of tons of orchids. And we would love to have partners that are in all of the towns across Broward County working with local institutions in those towns, whether it's a, you know, assisted living facility, whether it's a school, a homeowners association, whatever, you can see some potential target partners there. Um, you can also just buy plants for your, for your own society, for your own garden club. Um, you know, if you've got 50, um, 50 members and each one wants 50 plants, you know, that's a fair number of orchids. So that's another thing to think about. Um, even if you just buy some and for your members and they pay for them themselves, um, you're, we're getting orchids out into the environment across the county um, and they will, uh, they will grow. These are native plants, they will grow. Um, so these are all ways that, um, that you can get involved, you personally can get involved. Now, if you do that, you're gonna have to, your board is gonna have to be involved, obviously, and you're gonna have to work on policies. You're gonna have to figure out, okay, what do we, how are we gonna do this? And we've been through this um, as an orchid society. Um, I've worked with a, you know, a couple of homeowners groups. They've, they've kind of had to figure out like how they're gonna do it. And it's, it's really not complicated. It's really not hard. It's probably just common sense. Um, but you need to think about how much you want to help. You know, if you're going out to an assisted living facility, and by the way, Jason says that the assisted living facilities are absolutely the very, very best place to put native plants because it's a controlled environment and the folks that live there, the residents kind of like adopt the orchid that's outside their door and they watch it really carefully and they water it religiously and they pick the little bugs off. So their absolute highest survival rates are in, um, in assisted living facilities. Um, so that's just a little aside. But you know, how much assistance do you want to provide people? Um, do you want to have your members do the installations? Do you want to have a, another group do that? How much you want to charge? Um, I'll talk about finances later, but that's going to be up to you. Um, things like ladder safety, you know, our, we have a rule for Fort Lauderdale that we want two people holding a ladder. And we want one person up a ladder, two people holding it. And that's just our local rule. We want to be super safe. Um, so it takes a few more people to do that, but we want people to be safe. Um, health and social distancing, obviously you've got to figure that out. Liability waivers always come up. We've never um, bothered with that. Um, you may want to do that. It's up to you. It's your project. It's going to be your, your own policy. Um, so after you've developed these policies and stuff, scope out projects. Look at that list, you know, on the other slides. Like, where, what are some parks that we could go into? Who got, what's the governing body? Is it a state park? I've worked with state parks, and they're pretty challenging. Um, you'll probably do better with uh, local parks before you get to a state or even a county park. Um, but scope out the project. And again, we can, we can help you with that. Um, then get commitment from your group. And Equality Garden Club has really done a, a great job at this. I got to salute you guys for that. Um, you need to look for funding sources and you need to look for a plan on how to provide the initial care. So when the plants are installed, they need watering for the first like 30 days or so if it's not raining. Um, so somebody needs to, 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 to sign up to do that. And again, that's kind of like your club. You can negotiate with whoever's getting the plants, whether they do that. If you're going to a retirement home, the people that the residents, they'll be glad to go out every day and they will. Um, so that it's very much project dependent and project based. Um, and then, so once you're good to go, just give me a buzz. Um, we'll take a deposit. We'll get you on the list. Uh, the sooner you're on the list, the sooner you'll get plants. The plants are shipped in from Dominican Republic. They have to go through, through uh, customs. They go through, Site, there's have to get permitted, there's CITES permits, there's a lot of paperwork, they don't always make it through. It's not like ordering a widget from a factory in China or ordering an iPhone, you know, and you can watch it come from the factory in China all the way to your front door. Um, these are living plants and stuff happens. So we get them when we get them um, and we'll do projects and hand plants out in the order that we kind of take reservations. 
So that's how we're going to do it. Um, finances. Okay. So I said I'd talk about this. Um, we're all nonprofits. I'm sure you're a nonprofit. Probably most of the people listening are associated with nonprofits. Um, so our goal is not to make money. Um, but we all as boards have fiduciary duties to our societies to not to lose money either. So, um, I know what Fairchild is paying for the plants that they're selling to us. And I know that they have a good markup and I'm glad to have it there because it lets them keep doing what they're doing. Um, we mark up the price, our price a little bit over what we pay, uh, Fairchild, um, you know, I, and I can tell you stories about why we do that, but we, they're plants, plants die. And if we're, they're in our possession, then we eat the loss. So um, basically we're just trying to break even on this, make a little bit of money, um, but it's not a profit driven kind of thing. Um, our pricing, so the, the um, in, in Cyclia Tampensis that we just put 700 out or 600 out in Stunson, for instance, are three dollars a pop. Other species range from three to fifteen. Uh, typically, we're looking at 80, 85 percent of Insecta tempensis, and we've done a bunch of installations now. And the average has, on all but one of them, has been under four dollars. Um, there was one neighborhood that uh, Riverland Manors uh, is a gorgeous neighborhood. Their oak trees are already full of tempensis, and so they asked for. Um, larger specimens, they ask for more terrestrials um, and not so many ETs. So their, their, their cost was a little bit over, it's like $4.10 a plant or something like that. So that's kind of how the finances would work. Um, so that's how the finances would work. And I'd say, do you have any questions? But I can't take questions. Um, project sizing. So this is another question. Lots of people say, oh, how many plants are you talking about? And how are you going to do that? Um, so typically when we do neighborhoods, we're talking five or 600 orchids. And, the, or, and you think, oh, that's a lot. But the way that, um, the way that you plant these is we plant them in clumps. Uh, we, we're not looking at like finding 500 trees and putting one orchid you know, on each tree. Um, the way they grow in nature is they grow in clumps. Like if you think back to that picture I saw, showed you a while ago, they grow in clumps. So we plant in clumps. So that means that once you're at a tree, uh, we, we mount them with glue and we tie them on with string. So we put down a, a, a series of beads of glue and you put 10 orchids together in a little clump and another 10 here and another 10 further out on the branch. So you've got 30 orchids within arm's reach when you're on a ladder or on a step ladder or something. Um, if you're planting terrestrial plants, it looks a lot nicer to have a clump than it does to have one or two. So like at Stunson, we planted on Sidium and Satum, which is a terrestrial. And I think we put 40 together in a big drift and it's gonna look spectacular. Um, but you can get through 500 plants, 500 orchids very easily. Um, it's, it doesn't take that long to install them and they do, uh, we do plant them in clumps and it looks a lot nicer. Um, so just again, going back to kind of sizing, I mentioned already the goal that Oakland Park set for their fundraiser is uh, $10,000. Um, it's the first case that Jason's heard of or that I've heard of where they're using crowd, crowdsourced funding. And I think that's a great idea. Um, go out and ask your members to donate to a project that you want to do. If you want to do a park in what manners, you know, set up a GoFundMe and, and just promote it. Um, get the, the mayor to talk about it. Um, get the newspapers to write about it, and um, you can raise this kind of money in Florida. Um, we do have, uh, you know, a, a, an opportunity. We are getting some more plants um, later this month or, or August. If, if Equality Garden Club or some other group wants to do a pilot project this year, like maybe 100 plants or something like that, we could probably do that. We can't do any other big projects this year because all our orchids are tied up. Um, we are booking, as I said, large projects in 2021. Um, so book early and often. That's my motto as of yesterday. And I was support. So are we going to throw you out there and make you uh, figure it all out yourself? No, this is, the, this is what we do. Um, site visits. 
So, and everybody on that question sheet that I got, everybody was asking about this. Like, how do you know where to put them? How do you, how many do you put? I've done, uh, well, in residences, I mean, I do 20, look at 20 different sites in one residential planting. And so I've probably looked at 40 or 50 different sites at this point. I've done about eight site visits with Jason. Um, so we'll, we'll come and we'll help mark locations. We'll match up species with trees uh, and growing conditions, light conditions. Uh, and we'll even say, okay, you put 50 of this here, 20 of this here, 30 of this here. Um, so that's definitely, you know, you need that and we recognize that. Um, if you want speakers, you know, we're glad to speak. I do this, it's fine. Uh, we have other folks that can speak as well. Um, we always do a train the trainer. Uh, we have a kickoff event and we'll, we can train, um, we can train somebody that will train other people. Or if there's a team of people that are gonna be doing all the installations, we can train them. So we'll bring the initial supplies, we'll go through it with them, we'll take, um, you know, do 100 plants or something like that and get everybody uh, sort of skilled in, in the techniques that we use and learn how to keep the seedlings alive. And we have culture sheets for all these plants, so we'll give you that. And then we'll just schedule stuff. Um, you know, for Oakland Park, we were delivering orchids um, every Wednesday morning and we just went through until they were done. Um, so we'll work something like that out for, for taking plants. Um, so this is something I know you guys were talking about. So I just sort of played with some numbers. So if you guys decide to go into Richardson Park and do a project there, um, obviously you need to talk to Patrick and get permission. Uh, you know, that really helps a lot. Uh, so Wilt Manors Parks Department, they say, yes, cool, go for it. And I just, you know, a thousand is a good number. Um, plant cost is going to be about $4,000. So there's a fundraising thing you need to do. And then people are saying, oh, how long would it take? How much time would it take? And, you know, basically, um, that's kind of like the sort of number that we did up at Oakland Park. And we did it in three weeks. We did it with, you know, probably roughly 15 people a week. And, a, and all we were doing was a couple of hours a week. Um, if this was done, this is July, it's hot. We want to be there in the morning and we want to get out of there by 9 or 9.30. Um, if you sign up early and you're doing this in April or even May, uh, it's a lot easier to spend four hours doing it in the morning, start at eight and just go until lunchtime. And you can knock this out in one day. Um, it just depends on what time of year it is and how, how much stamina you've got. Um, in terms of tools and stuff, um, it's definitely, we're, for Lauderdale Orchid Society, it's not in the provisioning business. So we're not providing tools, ladders, trowels, that kind of stuff. Um, most gardening groups have a lot of that stuff. So um, we would rely on you for that. And then um, watering again would be, you know, you, you might have your folks do that. You might have the, um, the receiving group do that. It just depends on the particular situation. Um, and we're getting there. And so there were a couple of other questions. Um, and I wanted to just hit those. So iguanas, that's one question that always, always, always comes up. Um, what about iguanas? And I'll say this, we have, iguanas are a problem. So right up front, I'll say iguanas are a problem. They have, um, the county extension office has a list of plants that iguanas like, and it has a list of plants that iguanas do not like. And orchids are on the list of, of plants that iguanas like. So it's a, it's a stated fact, it's a known thing, iguanas like orchids. That said, in my neighborhood, we have iguanas, and we also have a lot of Encyclia tampensis in our oak trees. So I have deduced that the iguanas in my neighborhood don't like Encyclia tampensis. I don't know if I can generalize that to all iguanas, don't like all Encyclia tampensis, but I'm able to have orchids in the ground. I'm able to have, uh, I don't know how many, 800 or whatever, how many crazy orchids I've got. Uh, sometimes a flower will get eaten, but they don't really eat my plants. Um, so I, and, I, and I'm pretty active about killing them. So uh, they don't live long if they're in my yard, but uh, I haven't really had a problem and we haven't had a problem in this neighborhood. Um, so that's the iguana story. Um, survival rates is a question that everybody asks, and it, that, the answer to that, so, so the question is like, so if you put up a thousand orchid seedlings, how many are going to survive? 
And the answer, it sort of depends. It depends on the species, because some species are very sturdy. Encyclia tampensis, which is the bread and butter, uh, is very sturdy. Uh, Pseudopodium punctatum, even in nature, like only 40% of them survive. So us doing it, if we get 40% survival, we're thrilled. Um, in general, if you're planting in clumps and you're taking care of them, every clump is gonna survive. Not every plant in a clump is gonna survive, but every clump, every place you put orchids, you're gonna have orchids. Uh, so that's kind of sort of what we can say about survival rates. And then what else do we got? Are there questions from the field that I could take? I don't know exactly where my chat window is to look for questions. Uh, uh, can you hear me, Rich? Yeah, I got gotcha. you. All right, so we have a little bit of an echo, uh, just to warn you, but um, we have a few questions that we've been collecting from Facebook and from the Zoom chat. Okay. Some of them might be um, more of a, can you please repeat something or go into a little bit more detail? Sure, bring it on. Um, so the first one was, uh, I think you mentioned about people poaching orchids. Uh, mm -hmm. Isn't this just going to increase the number of people poaching orchids? No, 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 no. no. Could you, could you kind of expand on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. No, I didn't mean that, that there will be more people poaching because that's really not the case. Um, there, there have been orchids stolen. People steal orchids out of the Everglades and people have stolen orchids um, that were installed in Miami. The, the theft rate is what Jason has said about, and Jason, they put in 270,000 orchids, okay? I mean, this is not just a, a small sample, a very large sample. The poaching rate in Miami is way less than what he expected. So it's, it's generally like not a problem, okay? It's a question that people ask, but in general, it's not a problem. People okay. in Broward County don't go into public gardens digging up plants. Um, they don't go into your, mostly go into neighbor's yards and steal stuff. <laughs> so the, the point was that if there is somebody that wants to steal orchids, they're gonna steal orchids. Yeah. And if that person steals an orchid that I put out, instead of going out to the Thakahatchee, that's a win. Yes. A small one from my yard or a park in my neighborhood, then they go out to the Thakahatchee and take something that's 100 years old out of there. But generally, though, it's really not proven to be an issue. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, Another question, I, I think it pertains specifically to something you mentioned, um, that there's a particular f uh, fungus or fungi that grows on live oaks uh -huh. yeah. that is assistant to uh, growing some of these orchids. Uh, does that also appear on laurel oaks or perhaps other oaks in our area that are also considered native? Uh, could be. I mean, it's, it's, that is an area of active research in orchid, the orchid world. Uh, I have a Google Scholar. Uh, news feed that comes, like basically every scientific paper that gets published about orchids, you know, I get a digest of it every day, and I see research papers being published about mycorrhizal relationships all the time. It's very, very active research. Uh, I can't tell you about the laurel oak specifically, because uh, I just don't know, and I don't know that anybody knows. I don't know that a study has been done. Um, so. You never know. Maybe that'll be the next study that gets funded. <laughs> exactly. No, exactly. There's an opportunity. If somebody wants to try it, try it. I'm That's... sure they'll grow well in them. I'm sure that if we put a cluster up there, that they'll grow well. It's the perfect kind of tree uh, to grow in tempensis in. And because of the seed dispersion that I talked about, it actually doesn't really matter if the, if the seed germinates in the laurel oak or if it has to drift away three blocks to find a live oak, it doesn't really matter because they, they produce so many seeds that they're just floating all over the place. So they'll, if, if there's a fungus, they'll, they'll try to find it for sure. I, I have personally made the mistake of saying, oh, look, that seed pod looks ready and touching it and having it just poof yeah. in my face. <laughs> it's right. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, it's really amazing. Right. If, if someone has seed pods from native plants, maybe they've been growing them for a long time or whatever, and they uh -huh. get seed pods and they've never really known what to do with them, um, can they donate them? Um, who would they contact if so? 
Uh, that's a great question. Um, the, okay, so that's a really, it's actually just sort of a complicated question because most of the time what you're talking about is encyclia tampensis. Mm -hmm. Encyclia tampensis is on the commercially um, exploited plant list. So the state it. has a list of uh, threatened plants, endangered plants, and commercially exploited plants. And ET is commercially exploited. So there's really restrictions on what you're allowed to do with it. Um, I would not personally take a, 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 a seed capsule from somebody and try to reproduce it because I've got, I have five seed sources that I've got permitted. I, mean, I have to go to the state if I want to actually take that and do that and propagate that and use that in my million orchid project. I have to register it with the state of Florida. And I will, if that's one I want to use. But I've got five sources in Broward County already that I've done that for, so I'm not looking for more sources. Got um, it. What you could do, I mean, it's there are books on hobby flasking. You could learn how to flask. And, and there are also people in Broward County that do flasking. And if somebody is interested in the process, I'd be glad to hook them up, somebody with a seed capsule, with somebody that um, can do some flasking. And because it, it would be fun for somebody to try that. And I'd be glad to, you know, make introductions. But okay. for us, we're not going to be taking those seed capsules. Great. Okay. And, um, and I, I, this is going to sound silly, but I'm going to expand on this question a little bit. Um, it's not that silly. If, if they just happen to have these, could they just kind of crack them around a, a, a live oak and hope for the best? Oh, I do that all the time. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's okay. the fun part. The, uh, before they understood how all of this worked, before they understood like the mycorrhizal fungus thing, that didn't, they didn't always understand that. A hundred years ago, they didn't understand that. And what they used to do was they would take the seed capsule and they would uh, wait for it to mature, crack it open, and then they would sprinkle the seeds around the base of the plant. And that will, it, because oftentimes the fungus is sort of on the roots. So if you're, if you're like looking at it from a hobby point of view, that's something to try too. And so you just get the seed capsule, crack it open and kind of sprinkle it around on the roots. And, you know, good luck. Uh, I've never seen a baby. I've been doing it for years and I've never seen one. But I would you never know. <laughs> I would love to see it. Right. I, I know it's possible. I keep on doing it. I have a big chunk of bark that fell off one of the oak trees that's on a bench. And I go and I sprinkle my seed on it. And I water my bark. And, you know, <laughs> oak springs and carol. I love it. I love it. Um, so uh, I'm going to combine two questions that were posted. Um, both in Zoom. One is, uh, can orchids grow on fruit trees? And I'm yep. going to combine that with, are there any other preferred host trees? Meaning, if, if somebody was going to buy some of these and install them, are some trees better than others? Yeah, yes. The answer is yes um, to both of those things. Citrus works well. Um, there's a, there are a lot of uh, native orchid populations actually in some of the citrus groves, some of the old citrus groves. Oh, wow. So there's actually been able, they've been able to, to, to reproduce and to grow on citrus. So yeah, citrus is a good host. Uh, in general, the tropical hardwoods are good. Uh, you know, the mahoganies and um, any, you know, just the tropical hardwoods. That family of classes, uh, family of trees are good. Um, there's a, a bunch of, uh, as you would expect, like swamp, swamp type plants. There's a maple, a native maple that is really good. Uh, uh, pond apple is really good. Uh, button ash is good. There's, you know, if, but they'll grow on anything where they get enough light. Uh, when you start talking about um, trees that have a really dense canopy and a really heavy leaf cover, there's just not enough light going to come through. Got it. So if you think about how a live oak grows, um, the canopy is pretty open. You know, the, there's long, long, long branches, and the, it's not a dense canopy. So there's filtered light coming in all day long, and that's what most of the orchids prefer, is sort of a dappled light kind of environment. So a tree that's got a very, very, like a large leaf or a very dense leaf is not even going to be a good place to, to try to install them, because there's just not going to be enough light. Okay. Okay. 
And I'm going to expand on that question personally. Um, and this was something I think you might have actually told me, funny enough, at, a, at an Orchid show. Sure, sure. But um, could you talk about uh, whether it's good to install these onto palms? Uh, palm trees, yeah, OK. So we have some Certipodium punctatum, uh, which is the cigar orchid, which at one point was the rarest orchid in Florida. There were only about 25 left in the wild. And I have 25 sitting on a bench outside my house now. So it's not as rare as it used to be. Amazing. Um, they do really well in the, in the cabbage palm. They grow in the little, you know, in all those little pockets. It's a great spot to put them. Um, Tampensis, I would say not so good on palms. And generally, like most orchids, not so good on the native orchids because there's too much light. Bandas, you know, anything bandaceous, anything that needs a lot of light, Palm trees are great, um, but the native orchids or native orchids um, tend in general to want a little bit more shade. Now, all of that said, we did a project last year in a neighborhood, and we had some folks that are good gardeners, very enthusiastic, very interested. They really, really, really wanted to have some Encyclia tempensis on this palm tree in their front yard. And we all, we all like looked at each other and said, okay, well, we can write these off. But they put them on there, they water them religiously, and they're among the healthiest of all the plants that we installed last year. So it can be done if you're conscientious. It's mounted on the north side of the tree, okay? So it's getting shade. It's not getting even, you know, it gets no light from the south. Sure. And it's doing great. So it can be done. You just have to be really super conscientious. We. Um the reason I asked you, uh, we purchased a few orchids from you guys at, uh, I think it was two shows ago, the Tropical right. Plant Fair. Yep. And we have, um, we have some of them. We took a couple of them and put them on a palm tree yep. in full blazing sun. And I kid you not, the fullest of blazing sun. Yeah. Oh, I know. It's <laughs> and, really and they get automated drip watering every, uh, three, three times a day, every day, and they are doing fantastically. There you go, that's the, key. <laughs> that's the, key. the water is the key, right. Yes, it's the water, oh, very right. good, very good. Um, okay, two, uh, or one other question I have is, can you please repeat um, how someone should contact either the Million Orchid Project or you guys, to about a potential opportunity, about a community or a, a plot of land. We've got quite a few people who've commented, oh, there's this great plot of land that could work perfectly. Who do I talk to? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I put contact information for me up on the screen. I don't know if it's there, but it's, I think, it's, I think it is. I do see it. Yeah. Um, you know, in general, it, it's like, you know, we're not in a position to go out and put orchids into every little lot around Broward County. We'd love to be able to do that, but that's the kind of thing that, for, you know, Equality Garden Club could do, for instance. If you know, and that's exactly what I was saying, is that you know your town. You know where there's a little pocket park. And even, you know, even if you do what I call guerrilla gardening, you know, yes. yeah. <laughs> Kind of like underground guerrilla gardening. You go and you cut out the invasives and you put in some natives and you yes. just don't tell anybody about it. Um, you didn't hear about it from me, but it has been done. I uh, don't doubt it. Yeah, so, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Like if, if, the, if your club, you know, bought a thousand orchids, then you can do that kind of thing. And sure. uh, just on a small scale, a couple of you go over one day and just put some orchids in the trees, you know? And then you go and you water them and keep them going. So for larger groups, definitely get a get get in touch with us. Like if you're if it's the question is coming from another garden club, say, and they wanted you know buy five thousand orchids, then call me, give me a call, send me an email. We, we did have quite a few comments, and I might try to collate those for you of people saying, "Hey, the so and so garden club would potentially love to to right. join this." So I'll try to get all of those people to contact right. you directly. Yeah, I would love that. Yeah, we uh, actually have a committee. We have uh, five people in our Orchid Society. We have five people on our committee. I know that several of them are on this call. Uh, probably all of them are on this call, actually. <laughs> and so um, I would love to have some names for them to call. Absolutely. Wonderful. Yeah. Then yeah, we'll, we'll do our best to pull those together for you. I just can't uh, tell you. We're going to have so many orchids next summer. And we've always been constrained. It's always been, I've had to really dole them out, you know, very carefully and negotiate who gets what. 
and next year I think it's just going to be wide open. So anybody that's got a, you know an interest, I think now is the time, that's and we can really make a difference in Broward County. I mean, it's a real chance to make a you know a dent in or an effect in the horticultural world in Broward County. Yes, and I know that. I mean, I know the club is so excited. We sent out the poll and everyone who responded was just over over excited about this so i think everyone's very much on board it's, yep. it, yeah, it's great no all behind me this is my little virtual background this is about two thousand orchids behind me that's what's going on back there i love that i love florida natives we do have one other question that was posted that i want to get a little bit better of an understanding on um, some people were asking about the idea that they get shipped in from the dominican republic because uh -huh many people know that they actually have the project where they're growing a lot of the orchids directly at Fairchild's or other local places. Um, what is the difference between the ones that are being potentially grown in, in the Dominican Republic versus the one that, that are being grown here? Uh, the ones from Dominican Republic are better. Okay. The climate is better. They grow stronger. Um, they're grown in, in green, they're grown in some of the largest greenhouses in the world. Wow. Um, there are six acres of greenhouses um, that this um, it's a, an unbelievable um, operation it's an American company uh, their headquarters are in Maryland and so actually stuff goes through Maryland first before we get it um, but they have uh, they have four double laminar flow hoods so you have eight people working doing flasking and they have a double shift so they have 16 full-time people doing flasking work in this greenhouse. That's amazing. Every day. Um, so they're, you know, they, they don't blink like a hundred thousand orchids. No problem. You know I mean? It's like, they don't even, it don't even, it's like no problem. So, um, you know, and we do use local growers. I mean, they, Jason definitely sources stuff locally. The only reason that he went out of the country is because there are not, there are not enough greenhouses in Miami Dade County to house all of the material that he's growing. Got it. Um, we have, you know, actually I was going through the sources with him. There's, this doesn't all come from DR. But there's, I have, there's four different sources for plants we're getting in August, for instance. So wow. those are actually coming out of um, greenhouses down in the Redlands. I think that one, one batch is coming from Dominican and three different batches are coming from different greenhouses in the Redlands. And it's all about genetic diversity. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of science behind all of this. I'm kind of talking about it at a very glossy level. Sure. But, you know, he has a PhD in orchid biology and he does things in a very scientific way. And like every seed capsule I give them has a name. You know, it gets named in the DNA is tracked, the genetics for that seed capsule are tracked. So ah. CH2 is the name of the seed capsule that produced 100,000 orchids from Cooley Hammock. Um, it wasn't CH1, it wasn't CH3, it was CH2. <laughs> I, think, I think that, need, uh, that, little, that little pod deserves a, a, a placard somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're out of questions. Did you have anything else you wanted to say before I turn things over to Carl? No, just like give me a buzz and tell me how many thousands you want. That's, all I, that's what I want to do. I want to get a big list of thousands of orchids going out next summer. Very good. Very good. Well, thank you so much for joining well, us. Thank you. I really, really appreciate the chance to come on here tonight. And um, I hope you all learned something and had fun. I, I really like teaching, but I usually do it a lot more interactive than this. Um, so I hope I wasn't just droning away. Um, but Rich, we sincerely appreciate one of the most informative uh, presentations in our club history. Oh, thank you. A lot of information tonight. And we can't thank you enough, especially in spearheading this initiative. You've given us a lot of food for thought for our club to, uh, to address, especially for 2021 with those 100,000 orchids. So thrilled over that. Uh, the question and answers uh, that uh, we captured, we will post those onto our website in the next few days. Uh, members, as Van had mentioned earlier, we uh, sent out the questionnaire and not only uh, were you extremely responsive, but we generated a lot of questions as well that, that Rich addressed tonight. Um, as well, remember, I have, uh, I have all the volunteers identified and uh, we will uh, be communicating with you as opportunities arise. We thought we would be doing some more work at Stunson uh, uh, 
uh, trail uh, in the next few weeks. But as, uh, as Rich indicated, we planted the last 400 orchids today, but there'll be more opportunities coming up. Non-members who are participating tonight, we're thrilled that you are with us. If you are interested in becoming a volunteer in this initiative, do not hesitate to send us your contact information at info at equalitygardenclub.com. So if you haven't had enough orchid information, next month we have Mac Riverbark, who will be presenting uh, from Max, uh, Max Orchids and who will be uh, presenting on exotic orchids. Mac was with us a couple of years ago and uh, we were able to uh, get him back uh, for next month. So we hopefully you'll join us, uh, join us in August. With that, I will turn this over to our president, Van Goslin. And hello. Uh, I was amazed at the quantity of information in there. Really a, wond a wonderful presentation. I'm very, very happy that we were, we were able to get Richard out there to go and give us, a, to, to fill us all in. We had a good uh, participation on the Zoom platform. I don't know how many uh, were also attending on, uh, via Facebook, but for wh however you met with us, uh, thank you for your attendance and I hope you enjoyed and you certainly hopefully benefited from this. Um, the, million, the Million Orchid Project is uh, just another continuation of our dedication, the Quality Garden Clubs, to environmental sustainability and the community beautification. So uh, we're delighted to be able to promote this. Um, in consequence of all this, this, with this new information or this additional information, we're going to be having a, a board meeting tomorrow afternoon. And we're going to be discussing the details as to how the Equality Garden Club is going to participate in the uh, uh, MOP, as they call it, Million Orchid uh, Project. Uh, we're going to be responding to the uh, issues that membership have suge uh, the suggestions that the membership have raised, and we're going to be compiling a list of the volunteers for, from within the club and anybody else who might wish to, uh, wish to add their names to it. We're going to be discussing the finances, what kind of contribution we might make to, uh, to, to the Oakland Park project, which is our next door neighbor. And um, after this discussion, we're going to be drafting a proposal which we'll send to our membership. And uh, that will be within a few days. And um, we want to encourage everybody and anybody to contact us via our website for your opinions about this and any other suggestions we might have that you think that um, would benefit our community and our club. With that, I'll end this. Meetings going on beyond much of an hour get boring. I'll leave you. Thank you so much. Stay happy, stay healthy and stay tuned.